Amen. It's a little warm out there today, wasn't it? Yeah, it was warm Monday, too. Nice and warm. Anyway, let's turn to 1 Peter and let's uh, get into the Word tonight. Hope you all had a good day. If not, God's got it firmly in His grasp. Amen. He's got it firmly in His hand. He's in charge of everything. God always knows what He's doing. From before the foundation of the world, God had it all figured out. There's no mysteries to God. I remember a few years ago, I got into studying some of the writings and philosophies of Finnis Dake. Dake is supposedly the grandfather of the, like the word faith, name it, claim it, God wants you healthy movement. And some of his nonsense was just absolutely ridiculous. But he claimed that God did not, in fact, know everything that was going to happen or everything that was happening. That's why he had to send angels out to report back to him and tell him what was going on in the world. And that is a lie. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, the Bible says. So if you think, think about the number of locations there are in the known universe. And God's eyes are in every single one of them. That's a big God. Amen? Amen? So when your problem gets too big for you to handle, let God have it. Amen? When your, hey, when your sins get too much for you to handle, and they always do, let God have them. Jesus all, you'll find out Jesus already bore them to the cross. Amen. So it's, it's fun singing about the blood. Let's, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, we'll start in verse 19, and we're going to do a little study on baptism and why we do what we do when it comes to water baptism. What's the difference between water baptism, Holy Ghost baptism? We're going to look at all those issues according to the Word of God tonight. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this, this sunshine, Lord, is beautiful, and we thank you for it. Father, there's a lot of people that likes warm weather, and I pray, Lord, that you'd bless them with it. And I pray, dear God, that, uh, Lord, as your light causes everything, Lord, in our land to grow and turn green and look pretty, Father, that your light would also do that with your people. Lord, you said that we would be like a tree planted by rivers of living water that would bring forth fruit in season. And Father, we just ask God that you guide us, Lord, and that you shine your light upon us. Give us plenty, to, plenty of water to grow, plenty of good soil, deep roots, Father. And Lord, just bring forth good fruit in our lives. We understand, God, that the incorruptible seed will produce and bring forth incorruptible fruit. Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for great and precious promises that you have given to us. We thank you, Lord, for your word, for what it is, what it represents, what it says. And I pray, God, that you would bless all of those, Lord, who have put their eyes and their heart and their mind to study the words of this sacred volume. Father, let us be like Jesus, who, Lord, in his doings here on this earth, he swore that he would do it by the book. And so, Lord, help us in our lives to be by the book. Lord, fill us with knowledge, give us understanding, and then, Lord, in due season, give us wisdom. Bring forth fruit out of your people tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. First Peter chapter 3, verse 19. We have, uh, we have sort of dealt with the issue of uh, Christ preaching. Uh, we dealt with it on Wednesday night, and on Sunday night, we were going through our series on, on hell. And of course, uh, we looked at the issue of Christ preaching to spirits in prison. So we, hopefully you have a little bit better understanding of what that's all about. So we pick it up in verse 19. He's talking about the Spirit, quickened by the Spirit in verse 18. And it was by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. And then he says in verse 20, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. If you ever want to tell God thank you for something, tell him thank you for being long-suffering with you. 
How many years, just, this is just a rhetorical question, you don't have to answer it, but think of how many years you lived in disobedience to God. Think about what you did during that time. Think about the times when you may have cursed God or you may have cursed preachers or you may have cursed the Word and you didn't want anything to do with it and then one day God wrecked your life, broke you into a million pieces because that's what the stone does. You fall on that stone and you'll be broken and that's what happened. You fell upon the lively stone of Jesus and you were broken and all of those years God waited for you. He long suffered with you. He could have killed you at any moment and been justified in doing it. But His mercy on you, He long suffered with you. And God long suffered. If you, and we may go back to Genesis 6 in a little bit. But in the days before the flood, the Bible says that every imagination of man's mind was only evil continuously can you imagine and there's probably people now that their whole waking life is spent in evil and sin and wickedness every thought every word that comes out of their mouth is full of wickedness it's full of evil and that's the world that is being generated right now so once again we are as it was in the days of Noah. So this, what we're looking at tonight, I believe is very pertinent for the time that we live in right now, which sometimes we're disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. Uh, you might want to make a note. Do a study on the days of Noah. Remember what Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah. Go back and read the story of Noah. Read it again, read it again, read it again, make notes. Look at times. Look at the calendar, the dates that God gave. I'm not telling you this, these are the dates of the rapture or anything like that. I don't get into that. But just look at the order that God does things in. There's a period uh, like the 40-day period. Study, study the number 40 in the Bible. How many years did Israel walk in the wilderness? 40 years. How many days did Jesus... Uh, uh, was in the wilderness, 40 days. That, that seemed to be like a time of, of probation or a time of trial and testing and so on. So anyway, study that. Study the five months that the waters prevailed. In other words, they rose from the 17th day of the second month to the 17th day of the seventh month, 150 days. And then, at that point, then the waters began to go back down. They waxed for five months and then they waned uh, for the rest of the year. So anyway, just go, it'd be a good study for you to do, make notes, and if you don't get it, wait a while. Wait a while. Do some more study, and then one day, click, God might show you something. And when he shows it to you, send it to me, because I may be interested, all right? So anyway, while the ark was, when long, once the long-surfing of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight, Souls were saved by water. One of my term papers when I was in Bible college was on the Genesis flood. And I remember reading, I think it was Dr. Henry Morris, uh, who was a creationist back before, when there was no creationist. And he was sort of the pioneer of creation research. And his estimation was that it could very well be that from the time of Adam to the time of Noah, there could have been millions of people inhabiting the earth at that time. And out of all of those millions of people, it's just a guess, but out of all those millions of people that lived in that time period between Adam and Noah, eight people survived. Eight people What's interesting is we don't have a record of the faith of Ham, Shem, or Japheth, or their wives, or even Noah's wife. We don't have a record of that. We don't have anything in the Bible that says that God, that Shem, or Ham, or Japheth, that they found grace in the eyes of God. I'm not saying that they didn't, because obviously God saved them, 
but you can clearly see Noah being the patriarch. God definitely, he, was, he, was, he wanted to preserve seed, and I get that, but it looks like just on the surface that God saved Noah's family on Noah's behalf. And the reason why I'm saying that is, guys, never underestimate your standing with your family. Never underestimate God blessing your family on your behalf. And if you're not sure that's biblical, study Abraham. Out, God blessed Israel and long-suffered with Israel for one reason. That is because they were the seed of Abraham. They were the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of Abraham. God was blessing Abraham's family on Abraham's behalf. And so just kind of put the, plant that in your mind. So he says, a few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Now, so this, this verse, the churches of Christ love this verse. They want to use this verse to try to make people believe that you are not saved until you are water baptized. That's what they want you to believe. Some of their tactics are, I knew a guy, when I was in Bible college, I knew a guy that somebody contacted, I don't remember how, what the relationship was, but a man contacted a friend of mine that, that I was in Bible college with. And he said he needed to talk to him. He said he just needed counseling or whatever. And this, this friend of mine was studying to be a, a pastor, so I mean, he jumped on the opportunity, as I would have. And he met the man sitting at a table with all these books spread out and a Bible sitting there. And as he sat and listened to the man, it dawned on him that it was a setup. This man was with the Church of Christ, and this man was targeting my friend to try to get him to believe the Church of Christ way rather than the Scriptures. See, the Church of Christ, the, the denomination Churches of Christ, they believe that you are not saved if you are not water baptized in their baptistry. You cannot be water baptized in some other church and that be acceptable to them. And they are one of these exclusive denominations in that they really believe that they are the only ones who are going to heaven because they have the true form of doctrine that you must be water baptized in order to be saved. And this is, I've, I've watched some of their teachings, I've read some things, and I know that they love this verse because they want you to think that you are not saved unless you are baptized by water. Now, can you, and I'm just throwing this out to you just to think about, if you knew somebody that brought that up to you, could you, with Scripture, refute it? Could you do it? Okay? So, if you can't, or if that has come up to you, study it. Learn what the Bible says. Learn what it means. Learn that you cannot isolate one little verse out of the Bible and make your case with one verse out of the Bible. You can't do it. Jesus said, he who believeth and is baptized shall be saved, right? So doesn't that look like that you must be water baptized in order to be saved? But Jesus finished it by saying, but he that believeth not is condemned already. He did not include, he that believeth not and is not baptized, he did not include that in that statement. So what they'll do any cult, will, they'll have certain methods of operation. They will isolate Scripture, they will retranslate Scripture, or they will tell you that this, this, uh, your Bible is wrong, this is the correct interpretation, or this is the correct translation. Or, in the case of 1 John 5, 7, some groups even say, well, that verse should never be in the Bible to begin with. Well, it's there. How inconvenient is that for you? So anyway, so we're, that's what we're going to do. We're going to go from the Bible... And we're going to find out, are you saved even 
if you have not been baptized by water. So he says, verse 21, the like figure, the word figure, if you're taking notes, is related to the word example. I almost said egg salad for some reason. <laughs> example, egg salad, in sample, allegory, shadow. Those words are all connected. In other words, they're typology words. They're words that the Bible is giving you to show you that the story of Noah and the ark is a, is a doctrinal story. It's teaching God's way. It is manifesting the ways of the Lord. So, my and this is obvious answer, but my question is, so is it necessary that Noah's story be true? Is it necessary if it's just an allegory or a figure or an example or whatever? Can it be like Aesop's fables? Can a fable reveal the truths of God? Who said no? Thank you. Paul said we have not used cunningly devised fables. Fables are stories that are not true. Or we think they're not true. And so you cannot tell something that is not true to convey something that is true. Jesus, when he gave his parables, not fables, when he gave his parables, I submit to you that they were real stories, that they were people that Jesus had firsthand knowledge of because he's God and he knows everybody. And those stories actually happened the way Jesus said they happened. Jesus did not convey a lie in order to teach a truth. So is it important that the Bible's account of Noah be 100% Factual. Is it, is it an absolute? I say it is. Because if, if God's not telling the truth, and when I say God, I mean this, the Word. If the Bible's not telling you the absolute truth, in what is, uh, turn your, go ahead and turn your Bible to Genesis 6 and 7, because we're going we're gonna to be going back there. If the Bible says... Uh, verse 19 of Genesis 7, And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. If the Bible says that every mountain and every hill was covered, can one mountain or one hill be excluded from that? No. Can it be that it was a localized flood, and from Noah's perspective, all of the hills were covered, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all of the mountains of the earth were covered. Can it be that way? No. Because in verse 18, the waters prevailed and were increased greatly upon the earth. And it does not leave you any leeway or any... God is... The Bible says God is not slack concerning His promise. You know what slack is, right? It's what I'm wearing right here. No, it, it's like a rope is tight, and when that rope is tight, it doesn't move, it doesn't bend. If you let the tension go, you can take what was straight, and you can twist it a little, you can turn it a little, you can make it into however you want, and that's what some people do with the things that they say. They are slack in what they say, meaning that they can manipulate words and make them say or make you think something that they're not really saying or they can make you believe something that's not really true. And that's not God. If God is not slack concerning His promise, that means if God says it, it's gun barrel straight. And you can believe everything that God said. So is it important that according to the Scriptures, everything on the whole planet Earth was covered over with water? And if anybody says to you, well... There's, you know, archaeologists say and geologists say that it that couldn't have happened, it couldn't happen this way. Who are they? 
They're not the prophets. They're not the apostles. They're not going to be standing next to God saying, well, I didn't like him anyway, so he can't come into heaven. You're not going to get in because of what they said. You're going to get in because you believe what God said, and that's all there is to it. Can I get somebody to say amen? Okay. So anyway, the like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the... I'm back in 1 Peter, by the way. Thought I'd throw that to you. The like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. And we're going to deal with that. Because right in there, he's immediately injected any, I, I, any idea that somebody would say, well, see, water baptism does save you. Peter immediately jumps in and says, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, which would be water baptism. Although in our baptistry, there's, few little cobwebs and maybe a little spider carcass every now and then in there. Sometimes I try to get them out, sometimes I don't. Just letting you know, anybody wants to be baptized, you never know what's going to be in there, all right? So anyway, it's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's the answer of a good conscience toward God. Can water wash your conscience? Your conscience is not located on your epidermis anywhere, your skin. Your conscience is in here and in here. And only a certain type of water can clean your conscience. Anybody want to take a guess at what kind of water I'm talking about? Thank you. Uh, In fact, let's go ahead and turn there. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5, since I mentioned it. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that it might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The water of this baptistry is merely a symbol, a figure, a type, of the water of God's word that Jesus cleanses his bride with. Okay? It's the water of the word of God. That's how we're what. So, who in here, I mean, obvious question, but do you remember some of the things that you used to do that you don't want to talk about? Does it still bother you? Do you did them? It's good. Do you know that they're forgiven? How do you know that, George? The Bible tells you so. When in doubt, I I learned this from a young boy. If you ever want the assurance of salvation, read 1 John. 1 John says, These things have I written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. In fact, uh, I was trying to quote that verse a while ago when we were singing about the blood. 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, so don't say you have no sin. Verse 9, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, Two two attributes of God. God is faithful, meaning that he makes his promise and he keeps his promise. And he's just, meaning that judicially, once God offered the contract of the New Testament to you, he, not even he, can alter its contents. And he won't. God is faithful because he does what he promises he'll do, but he is also bound by his own word in a covenant that he will forgive your sins if you confess your sins. And anybody, we're in the days of social media now, so false teachers and false doctrines are everywhere on YouTube and Facebook. They are, it is slobbing over with false doctrine. And somebody is going to tell you that you do not have to confess your sins in order to be saved. 
Read that to me somewhere in the Bible. And I'll show you about 20 verses that repentance brings salvation. You believe that? What did you do? You confessed your sins. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So whenever, whenever your conscience is bothering you about things you've done, get in the Word. Read 1 John. Read Psalm 32. Blessed is the man whose transgression is covered, whose sins have forgiven. Blessed, I can't remember verse 2, but anyway, there's four things there where God says you're blessed and He's forgiven all of your sins. He's covered your iniquities and there's no guile in your spirit. And he, the Bible says in verse 7 of that chapter that uh, this is what, I can't, I'm paraphrasing, but he who is godly will pray these things. Godly people confess their sins to God. Amen? So anyway, so... The baptism that he's speaking of here is an internal baptism that purifies your conscience. And again, the words mean something. Con means with. Science means knowledge. With knowledge. And your conscience is the part of your brain that remembers, or let's say the part of your mother's brain that remembers everything you did when you were a kid. Because my mom, Todd, loves to tell stories on me. Don't believe her. Don't believe her. She'll tell things about me because she never forgets them. Unfortunately, I remember things about me that I don't forget. I'd like to, but I don't. But I have a knowledge now that overrides and supersedes the knowledge of what I've done and that is, those things have been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, and they have been forgiven. And God says he's cast them as far as east is from the west. He says he's cast them into the depths of the sea, and they are never to be remembered again. So don't believe Mormon doctrine. Don't believe Finnis Dake, who also says the same thing. These, these people say that if you sin, let's say, that, let's say that you lied to your wife. You lied to your wife. So... She caught you in it, so you're going to confess it to her. You confess it to God, God forgives you. Mormon doctrine, Finnis Day teaches that if you lie to your wife again, that God unforgives the first time you lied to your wife. He unforgives it and holds it back accountable to you. That's double jeopardy. And our founders were correct when they framed the Constitution and they put the law against double jeopardy in there. You cannot be tried twice for the same crime. It's illegal. God won't even do it. But they say that He does. They say that God uncovers your former transgression because you did it again. I am not aware of any sin that you're only allowed to do once. And if you do it again, well, then, then you're going to hell. Okay? I'm not aware of that. So anyway, it's your conscience. That, that's what baptism is all about. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Aren't you glad for that? Amen? He's on the right hand of God. What's he doing there? He's interceding. We pray in Jesus' name. We are not allowed to pray directly to the Father. We do not have that access. We do not have access directly to the throne of God. We are like Israel. We have to go through the mediator. And there is one mediator. Not Mary. Amen, Donna? Don and I say Donna because she testified of her Catholic background whereby they taught her that she could pray to Santa Maria, San Juan, Jean-Baptiste, I'm using, I'm, pardon my French, St. Matthew, St. Mary, St. John, St. Jude, St. Ignatius de Loyola, that's a good one, that you could pray to a saint, and a saint then would go to Jesus, for you. 
the Catholic Church says, well, do you listen to your mother? Well, of course you listen to your mother. Of course you do what your mother says. Jesus does what his mother tells him to do. No, uh uh-uh. That ain't it. That's not what the Bible says. Amen? Okay? So they say, they, they, they build this case whereby you can go, you must go to Mary and beseech Mary to go to Jesus because according to them, Jesus is angry at you. Jesus is mad at you. Jesus is ready to kill you. But Mary comes and steps in between you and the angry Jesus and intercedes for you so that Jesus or the priest who hears your confession will forgive your sins. That's a lie. And they are, have, the Catholic Church has been since John Paul II like this close for years wanting to make Mary co-redemptrix co-redeemer, putting her equal with Jesus in, as being necessary for your salvation. And I did a Watchman broadcast several years ago, this Polish Catholic church up in Chicago that has a statue of the Virgin Mary sitting on the Ark of the Covenant. Excuse me, can you say blasphemy? I knew you could. I just, okay. Anyway, he's at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let's teach about baptism. Not only is Noah, and I want you to get the idea here. Here is, here is Noah, and over here is the new world. Not the new world order, but the new world. And here's Noah, and here's the new world. What separates Noah from the new world, from the world that has been cleansed and purified with water. Don't you love a good thunderstorm in the summer? It cleans the electricity, cleans the air. The electrons from lightning pulls in dust particles from the air and draws it like a magnet and drops it down. It just, the air after a storm, you just go... Ah, that's good clean air, right? Okay? Water cleanses, water purifies. So here is the new world that's been washed in water. Here is Noah. What separates Noah from a new world? It's the water. Same thing in 1 Corinthians 10. Here is Moses and the Israelites, and here is Canaan land. What separates them, or let's say Mount Sinai, because that's where they went. What separates Israel from where God is going to meet them in Mount Sinai? The water. The water is what separates them. So in two cases in your... And then you can even go to uh, when Joshua finally was allowed to lead Israel into the promised land. God, if you look at a map, they could have gone like from Egypt up the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and been right there. That's not how God did it. God made them circle for 40 years, and then they came around. They came up and around. Let's see, you're looking at me, so I'll do it like this. Here's east. They came up and around to the River Jordan and then crossed the River Jordan east to west, and it was the River Jordan that was separating them from their promised land, and God made them pass through that. When Elijah, no, not, yeah, Elijah, when Elijah was translated, what did he do before he was taken into heaven by a whirlwind? He took his mantle, put it on the river Jordan, smote the waters, and they parted hither and thither. Him and Elisha walked to the other side, and then Elijah went up into heaven. So you have all these stories in the Bible about how water is sort of like the transition or the barrier between us or let's say, it, let's say in, 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 um, in Noah or Moses or Elijah or Joshua and the Israelites or whoever, they have to cross this water in order to be where God wants them to be. Here is Naaman the leper, and here is Naaman not the leper. And what separates him from not having leprosy? The River Jordan again. 
dip in the river Jordan seven, seven's the number for purification, sanctification. Dip in the river Jordan seven times and Naaman is going, that is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. And his servant said, you know, if he had told you to, you know, like uh, Jesse Duplantis who needs $54 million for a new jet. Did you hear that one? Jesse Duplantis, name it, claim it guy, needs, come on, Steve, 54 mil. Help him out. He needs a new jet. Okay? His servant told him, if he would have told you to do some odd thing, would you have done it? Yeah. Why don't you go dip in the River Jordan seven times? What's it going to hurt? So he did. And he's got baby skin now. Isn't that cool? So it, you see these stories of water separating between us. I said 1 Corinthians. Let's go to Genesis 2. Genesis 2. Let's look at it. Let's look at what separates us from where God is. Genesis 2, or Genesis 1, excuse me. I'm thinking the second day of creation. Genesis 1, in verse 6, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, which literally means expanse. He made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. So on the second day of creation, we know that there is an expanse of water. And we know then that God separated the waters from above the firmament from the waters that were below the firmament. Now, he calls that firmament heaven. In reality, how many heavens are there? And if you say seven, I'm going to hit you. Three. There is the first, and we know that from 2 Corinthians 12. Such a man was caught up into the third heaven. And so that is the abode of God. So, the first heaven is, you go outside and you see the sky, the birds. We know that on uh, day five when God created the fowl of the air, the Bible says that they live in the open firmament of heaven. So they, their dwelling place is the air and above the atmosphere there's a layer. And isn't it amazing that all these clouds know where the border is? Because they just ride on that firmament. How heavy is water? How heavy do you think a cloud is? A thunderstorm. A thunderstorm, you can always see the bottom of it from a distance. You live out in Oklahoma, the pan you can always see the bottom of those thunderstorms. How much water do you think is sitting on that firmament? Tons. Millions of tons of water. That water's heavy. Okay? And yet it sits right there and it knows its place. Okay? So that's first heaven. Second heaven is what we would call the cosmos, the universe, outer space. So that is separated from the first heaven. Second heaven is the atmosphere, it's where the stars, it's where all the planets are. And then beyond the universe, and we don't even know where it is. We can't even see it. I believe the Bible's telling you there is an expanse of water. Spirit water. And that separates us from where God is. And we're like Israel. We can't cross. Even if we built the spaceship, the Starship Enterprise, to travel at warp 9 and get there in 30 years to the edge of the universe, we couldn't cross it. We couldn't pass it. It's holding us back. God has to provide a way. So did he build a bridge? Did God build a bridge? No. He never... I read 
a copy of some Sunday school literature a couple years ago. And the Sunday school literature, the whole point was to get the students to imagine things. And they were talking about uh, Moses leading the Israelites. And it said, imagine that you were on one side and God was in heaven on the other and there was the sea separating you from God. Now, close your eyes and imagine God building a bridge for you to walk across to get to the other side. Now, Chris, why imagine God building a bridge when obviously that's not what God did? God did not build a bridge. He, he did what man could not do. He part, man can build a bridge, but you can't, we can't part waters. And God parted the sea. And it was, the whole idea was to get students to not care about what the Bible said God did and imagine some other way that God might do it for them. And that's, that's dangerous. Anyway, 1 Corinthians 10, are you there? I feel talkative tonight. How late y'all want to stay? My, huh? <laughs> An all-nighter. My sister's back behind you yawning, so I don't know what that means. 1 Corinthians 10, 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for that they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was sort of like Christ. That's not what it says, is it? I believe that a rock followed them. And I believe that that rock was Christ. Amen? That's what it says. And we know now, because we know the New Testament, we know that we look in the Old Testament and we see Christ on every page. If you know where to look, you know He's there. If you see a lamb, that's Him. If you see a rock, that's Him. If you see a tree, that's him. If you see, I mean, there's all kinds of types and figures and allegories about Christ in the Old Testament. And in this case here, it did not say that let's pretend that rock was Christ or let's imagine he said that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. So I'm going to bring up the idea what if somebody is water baptized? Does that guarantee that they are going to heaven? No. The whole land, people of Israel, every one of them were baptized. Crossing the Red Sea, they were all baptized unto Moses. And only two of them, Joshua and Caleb, got to go into the promised land. Only two. And here, we're, and we, how many Israelites were there? We know that by way of the census, there was 600 some odd thousand amongst the people of Israel that could have been, you know, maybe more than that during that 40 years. But out of that number, only two go in. Out of the millions of people that could have inhabited the earth in the days of Noah, only eight, almost did that, only eight go in. What does that tell you about heaven? Few there be that find it. You're not lucky. You're blessed. Seven billion people inhabit our planet now. You know, I remember, Melissa, the year I got saved, 1975, there was a missionary to France, Dennis Teague, he was preaching that week. It's our first year of camp. And I can remember this like it was yesterday. He taught us back in 1975 that the population of the earth was 3.7 billion. 1975, 3.7 billion. Now, 40 years later, there's over 7 billion people. And it's climbing, it's increasing. And out of 7 billion people, how many people are going to go to heaven? Very few. 
Do not consider yourself lucky. Consider yourself blessed. Tell God thank you that he elected you. Amen? Go to Matthew chapter 3. We have Christ's example of being baptized. Matthew chapter 3. Did Jesus sin? No. Did he need his sins washed away? No. So Matthew chapter 3 verse 13, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. Comest thou to me? John knew who he was. This is he. This is what he said. This is he that I've been talking about. So John said, no, 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 I have need to be bad. And Jesus answering said unto him, suffer or allow it to be so now. For thus it becometh us, you and I, John, to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. Then he allowed him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. It's beautiful. You're going to see the Godhead right here. In this verse, the Father, the Word, or the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So Jesus comes straightway out of the water, verse 16, and lo, the heavens were open unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And so Jesus being baptized, he's not being baptized for the remission of his sins because he had none. But Jesus, in everything that he did, was always our example. When he sat down and he had the, the Passover with his disciples, he was the example. Gave them the cup, gave them the bread, and then he sat down and he took a towel and girded himself and began to wash the disciples' feet. And he said, as I have done to you, so do you likewise one to another. I've given you this for an example. Do this to other people. Jesus loves sinners. That's our example. We should love sinners. Jesus uh, blessed people. We should be that example. Instead of cursing people, we should bless them. Amen? We should live as Christ lived, he came here, number one, to experience earth and to experience what we go through yet without sin. He came to die for our sins, but he came also to be the firstborn and to be the leader among us as he did, so we must do. And if Jesus felt it necessary to be baptized, to give us that example, should we be water baptized? If God provides the opportunity, you do it. Amen? Uh, let's see here. Turn to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, unless you have an NIV or a New American Standard or a Message Bible, because you won't find this verse. Acts chapter 8, when the Ethiopian eunuch Riding in the chariot when he was sitting there reading the book of Isaiah, chapter 53. And he, he didn't understand. He said uh, in verse 30 of Acts chapter 8, Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest what thou readest? And he said, How can I accept some men should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Verse 37 is the verse that's missing, Wayne, out of the New American Standard, the NIV, the New English Version, the Christian Standard Bible, the Message Bible, 
And all the modern translations have omitted verse 37. And look at the importance of verse 37. The eunuch in verse 36 asks the question, see here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? If you skip verse 37 and read verse 38, what do you get? And he commanded the chariot to stand still. You don't get the answer. So the Vatican can use that and claim you don't need to believe to be water baptized. Just be baptized. You let us sprinkle your head with holy water and God will bless you. You don't have to believe. I, I heard it from Tim Barron's, Wayne, that Mother Teresa sprinkling holy water on sick kids in India because she th thinks that if she sprinkles holy water on their head, she's baptizing them, and when these sick kids die, then they're going to escape purgatory. Yeah. They don't have to believe. They believe in Shiva and Ganesha and all these things. The, the, the Indians have like 200 million different gods. Okay? They don't have to believe anything. She just does a little ritual on them, and they go right to heaven. Sometimes I wish it was that easy, but it's not. It's easier. You believe. Amen? Amen? Okay. So, but the Ethiopian eunuch, verse 37, Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. That's important. Can't leave that one out. And I have read of churches pushing, Baptist churches, Pushing baptism, pushing baptism on people, especially children. One church in Fayetteville, Arkansas, one of these big mega Baptist churches, built a children's church area, built a baptistry in it, where sound effects and lights and everything, when a kid gets baptized, they make this big party out of it. Well, if I'm a kid... And they say, do you want to be baptized? Yeah! Because I want the, you know, the, the, the light effects and the sound effects to go off. When I, and confetti, if they had confetti cannons that would go off when a kid was baptized. That's insane. You know what they just did? That coupled with their eternal security doctrine just convinced an entire generation of children that they can go to heaven now because they were baptized. That held my dad back for years. Because his mother took him to church when he was little, and he was baptized at the Baptist church. And he was told he was already going to heaven. And I have a family member, not anybody you know, that died in his third drug overdose. And when I called to console his family, I was told, I remember he went to camp when he was seven and he got saved and baptized, so I know he's in heaven now. That's dangerous. Listen, I'm all about knowing that you're saved and God's got you in his hand. I'm all about it. But to tell a child when they're young that if they get it, just get in the water, get baptized, they're going to be fine the rest of their life. That's dangerous because it excludes faith. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And what was his answer? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So, Dr. Billy Graham. Is it really true that Muslims can go to heaven? No. And he said to Robert Schuller on television that he believes they can because they believe in God. It's a lie. It's a setup and it's a lie. You see, the Holy Ghost had already done on the inside of this eunuch what Philip was about ready to do on the outside. And that's the key. Let's stand to our feet.
So isn't it, isn't it just interesting, George, that verse 37 just happens to be gone out of the Vaticanus Greek document? Just interesting. Um, in Mark 16, 9 through 20, you exclude that out of the book of Mark, and that's the part about Jesus' resurrection. And the Catholic Church claims that Mark was the first gospel written, and that establishes the standard. So according to them, you don't have to believe in the resurrection, and you still go to heaven. So that's the kind of stuff they come up with by these omissions out of the Bible. Heavenly Father, thank you for the pure word. Lord, you wash us with the water, and you purify us with the water. Not of the city of Festus, not in Joachim Creek or Platten Creek or the Mississippi River or a backyard pool. You sanctify us by the water of your word. And Father, we believe what you said, that, that your word is pure. There's no defilement in it. There's no corruption in it. We believe, Father, that we are sanctified by the Spirit, by the water, by the blood, all three of these working together to cleanse us and make us whole and make us righteous. And Father, without this, we are nothing. We have no standing with you whatsoever. We thank you, Jesus, for giving us this example. We thank you for showing us this beautiful picture of what crossing Jordan's River is going to be like when we finally reach that shore. Singers and songwriters have written about it for years, Lord. And we see it in the Scriptures. And you've drawn for us a picture of what it's going to be like when we cross that river. Thank you, Father, for giving us water baptism, but thank you for giving us Holy Spirit, word baptism. Sanctify your people tonight. Bless and honor your word. Bless it in our lives and our hearts. Give us understanding, we pray in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Be nice to one another tonight. Say hi.